Uh, Mary Laura Philpott lives in Nashville. She is a bookseller, a writer, an editor, a wife, a mother, and a TV host. Her book, I Miss You When I Blink, is a memoir and essays about her life as an obsessive achiever, which are her words. She is a hard worker who really delivers. Um, but along the way to building her perfect life, she realizes that accomplishing her goals and checking the boxes hasn't left her feeling as satisfied as she expected. Rather than contentment, she feels anxiety, and her efforts to please others wasn't helping her create the life she wanted to live. I've known Mary Laura for several years. I met her first when she visited PNP from Parnassus Books in Nashville, I think about five years ago. Um, it's been, it is a really special thing to introduce um, a comrade bookseller and a friend to you all and to celebrate the publication of her new book. Uh, the essays in this memoir are funny and smart and warm and very Mary Laura. She's here tonight in conversation with Nora Krug, staff editor uh, for Book World at the Washington Post. And now, here's Mary Laura. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Erdogan. Am I on? Am I on? My mic is not on. Okay. Hello. 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 Okay. Hello. 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 It is on? Yeah. All right. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> that was awesome. Real quick, since you mentioned the bookstore thing, everybody back at my bookstore back home in Nashville likes to see who came out. So say, hey, Nashville. Hey, Nashville. Oh, they're going to love this. They love the actual waving. Thank you. I'm glad I, I'm not in the picture. <laughs> Thank you and welcome. It's Thank you. Thank honor. you for doing this with me. This makes you it can really see why fun. I related to your book because I have all of my questions on a <laughs> single piece of paper Very with nice. highlighter on it. So organized. <laughs> nice clean margins. And That's yet, good. There's a there's a spill on it though. So. <laughs> um, anyway, so while we're talking about spills and um, let's do you want to talk about chicken salad <laughs> to start with and or and why I'm asking you that sure. question. <laughs> salad the chickens okay, so this is so funny the chicken salad incident or the chicken salad story if you have not read the book yet um, it is a, a small piece within <laughs> one essay within a whole book and it keeps coming up again yes. and again it's a polarizing incident in the book apparently but it was a polarizing incident in my life too it was um, it, it takes place within an essay called sports radio and at the beginning of sports radio I explained that one of the things that always makes me feel a little set apart from everyone around me is that I do not share the obsession with sports that so many Americans have and that all my family members have it's just not my thing so when I get in the car and my husband has the radio turned to sports radio it makes me want to set myself on fire I hate it um, and I hate it in this really irrational way almost as if it's it's being done at me to spite me um, <laughs> And that's how the essay begins, and then it kind of takes a sharp turn, and it goes, speaking of that, one time I went to this dinner party, <laughs> and the conversation at the dinner party was not about sports. It was, for some inexplicable reason, for 19 straight minutes, about chicken salad. And it was not people I knew really well. It was women who I, sort of friends of friends who I, I knew from around town, and somebody starts up with, oh, this chicken salad is so good, and the hostess says, oh, thank you. And do you bake that chicken or do you boil it? Well, I bake it. How long? Do you put salt in it? And it just kept going and going and going. <laughs> and, and I became irrationally, just like with the sports radio, irrationally just incensed about why are these women who are really smart and are here from all different walks of life talking for 17 minutes now about chicken salad. Um, and I went home to my husband that night and I was seething. I was like... This is the worst night of my life, and I'm so angry. And then I had this moment within that rave where I was like, what, what is wrong with me? Why am I that mad about people talking about chicken salad? That's not that weird, but I'm really upset about it. And I think the thing that was upsetting me was it had occurred to me that maybe they were all talking about chicken salad for this length of time because they had all recently had children. And I didn't like the thought that these smart women were only talking about how to make chicken salad instead of the news or movies or literally anything else because they had turned 
domestic like they had been possessed. I didn't, I had that, I had that thought and then I was mad at myself for having the thought because I don't believe that that's true. I don't believe that that happens to our brains. And then I was mad at myself for feeling left out and I was just mad. And it marked a moment in my sort of mid to late thirties where I became aware of the fact that a lot of the things that people around me enjoyed, I didn't enjoy as much. And I became aware that I had been feeling lonely for quite some time. And a lot of what this book is about is loneliness and when you feel out of sync with other people. So that's chicken why, salad. Why we related to it. So I know there's there's someone <laughs> sitting over here who I've had long conversations about what to buy at Trader Joe's for like 20 <laughs> minutes or more, which is I think my own chicken yeah. salad. And um, to be clear, there's nothing wrong with chicken salad. There's also <laughs> nothing wrong with talking about chicken salad. But when it's not what... When you find yourself in a conversation about something you don't care about and you feel like you're the only one who doesn't care and you something is wrong with you, it's really isolating. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, to get more general, um, <laughs> so, I mean, your book is wonderful in many ways, um, but to me it was sort of, it felt like it was... And I mean, it's in the nicest way. It was kind of like a, a, an unintentional self-help book in a way because it's like, um, you know, but we don't have to journal and we don't have to like not have carbs or go hiking or do anything. We just kind of can relate to you and understand that like reinvention doesn't mean any of these crazy things, but just sort of small things that either happen to you that are good or bad or taking a, a small, a small leap. Yeah. Um, and so I was wondering, um, I guess, was that your intention and what, what you hope um, we get out of this book? That's a good question. I the intention, I'm one of those people who I don't know what I'm writing until I've written it. So I, I always start things with one intention and then I end up landing somewhere else. I'm like, oh, I did not know that's what I was going to do. When I started, my intention at the very beginning was just to see if I could write a book. To see if I could write a stack of essays that cohered into a thing. And I told myself, worst case scenario, if I write a stack of essays and they don't cohere, I've got a stack of essays and I can sell them and I've got my next two years of freelance work done. So I started with essays that I had already published some places but that I had more to say on those things and then I started adding more and and the things I was adding to that pile were pretty random like a, a topic would occur to me or I would hear someone say something and I would think I gotta write about that and so the stack started building and it was not cohering at all it was just a stack of things and I got probably about three quarters of the way through it. And around that time, the same conversation happened around me three or four times within about a week. It happened in the bookstore. One day I saw this group of women came in and they walked over to the memoir section and they started pulling down books and opening them up and flipping through them and, and then putting them back. And as I was just telling you, one of the things I do at the store is I go in and, and eavesdrop and just see what people are excited about. And so I said, can I help you find something? And they said, well, what do you have like these? But um, And they couldn't finish the sentence, but I think what they meant was like, what do you have like this but for me? What do you have here in this memoir <laughs> section about reinvention and needing a fresh start, but that isn't the blow up your life tale? Not the one where... Not the memoir where I have to sell my belongings and change my name and put on a backpack and travel the globe. But what else do you have like that? So that conversation happened. And then around the same time, I was hiking around Radnor Lake in Nashville, which is this beautiful outdoor spot we have right in the middle of the city. And I was eavesdropping on the two women behind me. And they were hiking along. And one of them goes, I feel so good when I get outside and hike. It's just like it clears my mind. I feel... I just feel like I can handle everything. And the other one's like, yeah, I feel like Cheryl Strayed, you know, when she hikes the Pacific Crest Trail. And the other one goes, yeah, I need, like, wild for regular people. <laughs> and, it, and as I'm... You should have used that as your sub. Well, yeah, as I was, you know, walking right in front of them, I was like, am I writing wild for regular people? And that, then that became my intention. So that far through, I went, maybe... May, let me go back and look at this stack that, I'm, that I've been writing. And I could see there was a reinvention theme happening again and again in this book. I come to decision points, little decision trees in my life where I think I've done what I intended to do. And maybe I did it for a few years, but then it isn't the right thing for me any, anymore. And I have to make a change. So that intention came late, but it helped me finish the book. Um, well... Um, speaking of your book, would you like to read something from it? Yes, I would love to read. Um, 
I think what I'm going to read tonight, I think I'm going to read one called Lobster Man. I don't know if, has anybody here actually read this yet? It just came out. Oh, my sister-in-law has read it. (laughs) Shockingly, shockingly, my husband's twin sister has read this book. Um, So this is one that occurs... Let me find it. It occurs about that far into the book. So it's near the beginning. There's nothing you need to know that happens beforehand. It doesn't leave you on a cliffhanger. There's nothing that happens afterward that is going to be confusing. It, It sort of stands alone pretty well. So here we go. Each time I wedge myself into a tiny chair at a lima bean shaped table for another parent teacher conference, I remind myself not to panic. Whatever the teacher reports my offspring have gotten up to lately, I probably did something similar as a kid, and I turned out okay. (laughs) In kindergarten, I got in trouble for scribbling little hatch marks on the sides of my worksheets. Not once, not twice, but again and again. Whenever I completed my subtraction or my fill in the blanks, I began graying in one corner of the paper with my pencil, methodically covering the page and lines until the whole thing was unreadable. The teacher brought my mom in and asked me in front of her, why, Mary Laura, why won't you stop? To which I replied, I don't know. I was confused. Why did it matter? I'd done my worksheets. The answers were right. She continued, if you don't stop, you'll have to skip art. I stopped for a day or two, then started again. It seemed so harmless. So I found myself sitting alone, banished to a little table where I would supposedly sit and think about curbing my scribbling habit. My friend Cynthia sneaked me balls of Play-Doh, and I mashed them against the underside of the table into blue and green and pink pancakes. Once I was allowed back from exile, I quit scribbling on my papers, but I never did understand what the big deal was. My third grade teacher reprimanded me almost daily for writing in phrases instead of sentences. We had to read these little paragraphs. Mike drives a bus in the morning. The bus is red. Children get on. Children get off. And then we were expected to answer questions about them in complete sentences. But tell me this, if someone asked you, what does Mike drive? Would you say, Mike drives a red bus? Or would you say, a red bus? I bet you'd say, a red bus. Otherwise, you're wasting words, right? No sense being redundant. Alas, my teacher did not agree. I got an F in writing. But I stand by those sentence fragments. Economy of words. In seventh grade, we were instructed to keep a journal for two weeks. We could journal as a verb about anything at all, the teacher said. Anything. The point was to write every day. So for two weeks over Christmas break, I chronicled the plot of every episode of The Young and the Restless. (laughs) When we returned to school and took turns reading our journals aloud, everyone read about their feelings and their daily activities. I read about how Nikki and Victor were fighting again, (laughs) and no one knew if Danny and Cricket would ever get back together. My classmates laughed, which I liked, and said, I can't believe you wrote that, which I didn't like so much. Why couldn't they believe it? We were allowed to write anything, right? Why was my thing weird? For that matter, why didn't anyone else write about TV? In 11th grade, My English teacher gave our class a pop writing assignment in which we were to write a story that began with the sentence she wrote on the board. The sentence was something like, the lobster man looked out over the water, dot, dot, dot. I don't recall exactly, but the word lobster man was definitely in there. I remember thinking really hard about this character and what a difficult life he must have had being half man, (laughs) half lobster. (laughs) He's the most human-like of the monsters and the most monstrous of quasi-humans. He walks on two legs and doesn't have superpowers. He can't shoot flames from his eyes or breathe underwater. He is almost totally normal, as people go, but for that one little thing. Where other people have fingers, which they use to hold on to coffee cups, to wave in greeting, to clasp each other in love, He has a hard, sharp pincher that would crush human bones if he tried to shake hands. He wears oversized sleeves sometimes, so his difference isn't always immediately noticeable, but everyone figures it out eventually. 
He can't carry open weave crocheted shopping bags. The holes catch his claws and snag. He's lost too many groceries this way. Oranges and cans of crab meat rolling across the sidewalk. But on the upside, he can remove the crimped metal tops from beer bottles without a bottle opener. He sunburns easily. He has a real name, maybe Melvin or Jake, but no one remembers what it is because everyone around town calls him Lobster Man, (laughs) but only behind his back because most people don't talk to him at all. Poor Lobster Man out there living among regular men with regular hands, misunderstood, impaired, shunned. I found out after turning in the paper that a lobsterman is a person who catches lobsters. (laughs) Like a fisherman. How did all my classmates know that? We lived nowhere near the water. When my son was three, my spouse and I sat at another lima bean table as his preschool teacher told us that he was failing to complete tasks that involved cutting because he was unable to hold a pair of scissors. She asked why we hadn't taught him this basic skill. Wait, I said, are we supposed to be keeping sharp things away from him? I thought I'd been such a good parent, creating a safe, blade-free environment for my toddler. The other parents were teaching their little ones to cut, I guess, while I was snapping up all the scissors in the house going, nope, not for you. Why didn't I know? In school, we're taught to do our best, but we're limited by the bounds of what we understand to be right. And right looks different to everyone, apparently. Maybe we all walk around assuming everyone is interpreting the world the same way we are and being surprised when they aren't. And that's the loneliness and confusion of the human experience in a nutshell, or lobster shell. (laughs) I wonder how many times my children will find themselves in lobster man story scenarios where they're doing one thing only to find out later that everybody else was doing another. And how many of those will be because I lobster manned something as a parent? Quite a few, probably. And there's no way to see them coming. But tell me this. Which would you rather read? A story about a guy who catches lobsters? Or a story about a guy who is a lobster? (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. I turn red when I read, and I'm not embarrassed. Or You're trying to be a lobster. Yeah. It's just I'm on theme. I don't know why, but that happens every time I read. Well, I think you should have gotten an A on that and <laughs> Thank on you. the story about it. But. <laughs> um, speaking of A's, um, <laughs> so one of the threads or a rope, you might say, running through this book is um, the idea of perfectionism and um, how it has um, something that you have struggled with. And I think I know I have on my paper <laughs> um, struggled with as well. And um, you know, toward the end of the book, you get a you you, I, um, you seem a little bit more comfortable with making mistakes, and I'm just wondering how to how does what would you advise a perfectionist on learning how to be just okay? I don't know that I have mastered how to be just okay. I, the, the perfectionism is in me. It is like I think if you dissected my cells, you would find it at a cellular level, whether it was there from the beginning or I got made that way as a kid. And there, and I debate that a little in the book. I don't know. But what I have learned to do is to be aware of it. Mm-hmm. And at least to, to see myself doing crazy perfectionist things and go, okay, you know what? You don't have to have all the shoes in the closet pointing in the same direction. <laughs> no one comes in this closet, but you, um, I've gotten a little bit better at holding on to multiple emotional states at one time. Part of part of the way perfectionism screwed me up <laughs> is if you're a perfectionist, you have that belief like you have to eat all your vegetables before you can have dessert or you have to have your room clean before you can go outside and play. Like things have to be perfect before you get to enjoy anything, which maybe works when you're little and you just don't have that many things to do. And it really is just eat your broccoli, clean your room and you can play outside. But when you get to be an adult and there are so many things going on, so many different levels to your life, they are never going to be perfect. So if you do this thing in your head where you say, once everything's perfect, I will be happy, you will be miserable. And so I've at least become aware of that. And I let myself go, okay, so things at home are great. 
and things at work are okay. All the trees in my front yard are dead, and I was late for a meeting. And also, it's a beautiful day, and I'm happy. And letting letting things be imperfect and still be in the moment and be content took me a lot of work. I mean, I think the vulnerability that you show in the book also is... And, and how do you, um, I guess, pass along this to your, your children? How do I pass it along to my children? Or your, how do you deal with perfectionism? Um, well, I have two very different children. They're two very different individuals. Um, one has a little more of the perfectionism than the other. And I, they're, they're different from me. But one, of the, one of the little weird coping strategies that I developed early on in their childhood that I thought like was just brilliant was it when they got home from school instead of asking them about their grades first thing which is what my mother used to do I would come home and she would go what would you get on your math test what would you get on your science test what about that English paper and if I got A's she would beam and if I did not get A's she would not beam and I write about that in here and I don't blame that for how I became me but it's, it's a factor it's in there so I decided that once my children started school I would not ask that those types of questions when they got in the car I would I would have a different go-to line of inquiry so they would get in the car and I'd go what'd you have for lunch and that became a habit so every day they get in the car now now they come home they're big they're teenagers um and I go what'd you have for lunch and they know I'm gonna ask so now they get in the car like I had pizza for lunch (laughs) and probably what is gonna happen is they will get to be 40 and write a book with like every day my mom asked me what I had for lunch (laughs) and now my relationship with food is weird (laughs) but but that was that was my little like one little way that I tried to change it I'm actually planning on borrowing it so go for it (laughs) I mean I think we all do that like we 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 react against how we were parented but it just sort of, it pings, ping pongs back and forth. Every generation is reacting against the thing that came before. We probably all land in about the same place. Um, so in your, in your book, you, you, you also talk about some rather serious um, issues like um, depression and fertility. Um, and I was just wondering why you thought it was important to be so um, open about those. So open. Those were some of some of those essays that get into depression and fertility and like real hard stuff came early in that stack. And they happened because they were just stories I needed to tell because I'd been holding on to them for a long time. And it was like, well, here I am at this keyboard. I can't get to anything else until I get this out. And so they ended up in that stack. And then others of them ended up in that stack toward the end when I had sort of found that purpose to the book. And they were... Um, especially the ones about the d- depression in my late 30s, those were things I didn't want to write about because I didn't want to go dwell in that moment again. It's really it's really tough to write about depression once you've gotten out of it, especially if you are prone to it, because it means you have to go put yourself back in that mental space, which is it's just scary. You know, like kids would leave for school and, and I would sit down in my office and be like, okay, walk back to that time when I couldn't get out of bed and take a shower. What did that feel like? And and then I would write for a few hours and have to walk myself back to, but now I do want to get out of bed and take a shower. I'm going to go take a shower. Um, But I wanted to write about those things because I didn't really feel like the overall arc of the book would work without it. Um, The book didn't have an arc for a long time, but when I got toward the end and I... I actually printed them out on paper and put them on my floor and I spent a whole day like moving them and cutting them with scissors and moving different pieces around because I did want the collection to work as a start to finish thing. And when that arc came into view and you could see here she is becoming the little baby perfectionist and here she is getting out of school and realizing that doesn't work in adulthood. And here she is again and again and again banging her head against the same rock, which is I can make everything perfect. I know I can. It's going to work. And then you have to tell the part of the story where it fails to work. And then I find my way out of it. So it wasn't so much that I was like, I feel so brave about being vulnerable. It's like, I can't, I can't do this without that piece. I still think it was very brave. (laughs) And I, I I was cheering up on the Metro when I read some of them. So, but there's also a lot of laughter. So don't be scared (laughs) to read it. (laughs) Um, So I also, I was going to say, I found myself 
like shaking my head and like going, oh yeah, that's right, that's right, um, about a lot of your observations, thinking you had put them so well. And one of them, which I have highlighted here, um, is we go through life looking for proof that our choices are right. Um, which I think is another theme in the book. And I was just wondering um, how you work yourself through that, that loop and what advice you might have for some people, I don't know, who, um, who might also feel that way. Yeah, confirmation bias. <laughs> Walking around trying to, be, trying to find proof that the things you have done were the right things. I read the best tweet the other day that it's, it so encapsulates a lot of what I wrote about. I kind of wanted to be like, oh, you could rip this chapter out and just put this tweet here. It was by <laughs> Ashley Ford. Do you know who that is? She's a writer. She lives in New York. She's, um, she's at work on a memoir that will come out... I think in a year or two, her father was incarcerated for much of her life. Um, and so she writes about what that was like as a child to grow up with your, her father in prison. She's a wonderful, wonderful writer. She's also a, an interview host. We do a lot of the same things. So I'm always sort of aware of her because our careers are kind of on the same path. But she's so clever and so smart. And she had this tweet that now I am not going to say even remotely as concisely as she did. But basically it said, don't interpret other people's lives as judgment on your choices. Like, you can't interpret the fact that if you choose to move to Japan and become a rock star, you're saying I'm boring because I chose to live in Detroit and make sandwiches every day or vice versa. That, it was so succinct and so lovely. I'll try to find it again and retweet it tonight so you can see it. But um, that's what all that is about. And I, I used to assume other people thought things about me that I don't think they were thinking. You know how you could walk around and be like, does she think I'm, does she think I'm a mess? Does she think I'm this? You know, but they're not thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves. Um, but we talked about this the other night in New York. Somebody asked, how do you have, how do you recommend having empathy for people who are for perfectionists? And I said, and I swear this gets back to your question, but I said, when you see somebody who looks like they are perfect, and they have everything together. And you're like, oh, Nora, look at you with your perfect pink shoes and your, and your hair is all cute and your jewelry matches your skirt. You, you must think you are better than me. Remember that you know nothing other than what you see about that person. And you don't know why they took such care matching their jewelry to their skirt or why their hair is perfect. And for all you know, maybe they do think they're better than you. Probably not. Maybe all that perfectionism is their attempt to prove that they even deserve to be here. For a lot of perfectionists, that's what we're doing. We are obsessing over tiny things and trying to make them perfect because somewhere in our head, we believe we have to, to prove it's, we're worth breathing air. Does that answer that at all? It does. Okay. And, and as I mentioned, I, my, my outfit was seriously it's so good before I left it's that. so good. <laughs> and my daughter and I don't me, think you yeah, think you're better than me. I, <laughs> I don't think you think. <laughs> no, I was going to say my, my daughter told me that I looked like I was from the fifties, and my son told me I should be wearing Jordan. So, I definitely <laughs> try that next time. I didn't maybe. leave the house feeling so confident, but <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you you actually made me feel better. So, um, boring question, but do you have a favorite essay? I mean, I know I have a couple of favorite. One was the one that made me tear up. And the other one, there are people from my office here, so I shouldn't say, but it was about um, when she quit her job <laughs> um, <laughs> um, to work at a bookstore. Um, so, but anyway. Which I'm sure you're in no danger of I doing would it never all. Do fine, that. But I bet they would give you a job here if you wanted one. Uh, I spoke to a group of investment bankers last week okay. at this corporate thing, and somebody said, like, what advice do you give to to younger professionals and I said if you hate your job quit and they and so many of them like lit up and I thought <laughs> oh no <laughs> like what if I leave here and next week there's like 30 resignations <laughs> sorry um I had I love all the essays and I feel like I can say that and I'm not bragging and going I love my essays that I made myself there's this wonderful there's this wonderful gap in time between when you turn in a finished manuscript and it's fully edited and you're not allowed to ever touch it again and when it comes out and it lives on bookshelves and in that year of time it starts to exist separately from you and it no longer feels like my internal organs are sitting here on this table next to me it feels like that is something that exists utterly separate from me and it is something that you will experience in your way and you will experience in your way so I'm proud of it in the way 
I'm proud of it like you're proud of your kids when they grow up and they turn into people and you're like, you know what? I, I, I didn't have anything to do with that. You are you and I am proud of you. So I've, I have a lot of favorites. I think one of my favorites um, is the title essay, mm-hmm. the first one that explains where the title came from. Um, it's one of the first ones that I wrote because this book had a title before it had anything else. Before I challenged myself to go, I wonder if I could write a book of essays. I had this title that I was walking around trying to figure out what I could stick it to. Like, should I write a movie called I Miss You When I Blink? Should I write a novel called I Miss You When I Blink? I don't know how to write a novel or a movie. So I couldn't write those. I did what I know how to do, which is essays. Um, I like a letter to a type A person in distress. That was the one that, um, it's different from the others because it's not a personal story. It's not like once upon a time this happened and I asked myself this and then it ended up like this. It's a direct address to the reader and to a particular type of reader and a type of reader who is a lot like me. And it was fun to write because I was telling the reader things I would want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Did you like a rock star? Like a rock star, Nora. Here, no. I, mine is off, so. Oh, there you go. Here, no, here. <laughs> Can you tell us about those two essays? <laughs> Um, I can tell you about those two essays. So I Miss You When I Blink, the title essay explains where the title came from. I can also brag about that title because I didn't make it up. (laughs) My child did. And he is now a big, tall teenager, much bigger than me. But he um, coined that phrase when he was six. And we were down in the basement of my house at the time, which is where my freelance writing office was. And I was on a deadline and really, really concentrating. And he wanted to go to the park. So I handed him a notepad and I said, Mama's going to write, and now you write, and when we're both done with our writing, we get to go to the park. And so I turned around and started doing what I was doing, and he started rhyming and making this little poem on the notepad, and it was like, I miss you in the sink, and I miss you in the rink, and I miss you when I blink, and I miss you when I blink just caught my ear, and it, it took me out of what I was doing, and I said, wait, what? And he said it again, and I took his little piece of paper that he had written it on, I still have it, and I stuck it on my office wall on my bulletin board and I walked past that piece of paper every day for years. And it was, at first I just thought, it's so cute. You know, I miss you when I blink. What a clever thing for my brilliant little baby to have said. Um, <laughs> but over time it started picking up all these layers of meaning far beyond what he could possibly have intended. Um, I'm sort of obsessed with time and how fast time goes the older you get. And so the when I blink thing kind of stuck with me. Like we, time is going by in a blink and the I miss you thing stuck with me, especially as I, I got older because there were versions of myself that I was missing and there were moments in the past that I was missing. And so it ended up being the right title for this essay, which is about a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, the letter to a type A person one that I was saying is sort of a direct address to the reader. It's It was really fun to write because I was saying things I wanted to hear. Like, look, I understand that when you get really pissed off about that car that has parked over the line in a parking space, it is not about the parking space. It is because you hate that everybody, you know, people just don't care about rules and you're the only one who cares and it feels like you have to carry all these heavy things. And that it ended up being a very short essay because I cut it down and I edited it so that it would be really tightly composed but the original draft was really long and it was everything I ever wanted to hear it was like I know that you want to murder that guy who left the fridge open in the office (laughs) kitchen and that's okay um so I like I enjoyed that one because it was fun to write I know now you you can interview me now um Um, I, I, I know I've asked you all the fairly serious questions, but I, I should, you should all know that this book is really, really funny more than anything else. And um, there was one little tale about your, your mother and your Barbie dolls. Um, <laughs> um, that you, did your mother really sew underwear for your Barbie dolls? <laughs> and tell us why. Yes. My mother sewed a complete lingerie wardrobe. <laughs> for my Barbie dolls, because at the time, uh, maybe they do now come with underwear, but in the 80s, they didn't come with underwear. You got these Barbies, and they had, like, glamorous gowns and horseback riding outfits and stuff, but they had no underwear. It really bothered me, because that is not a complete outfit, and I wanted every, I wanted the Barbies to have 
all the layers. And just so you know, when you make the underwear for the Barbies, which looks really cute when you like wrangle it onto your Barbie, then you can't get the Barbie clothes on over it because they weren't made to go over underwear. So it was a, it, it was a wasted effort. My Barbies could either wear their underwear or they could wear clothes. Yeah, that's, that's a true story. Do you, do you still have these? The Barbie underwear? No, I do not. No. So a f- funny thing about my mom, um, I could have Barbies. I'd have the Barbie clothes. She made me the Barbie underwear, but she had a thing about um, it wasn't good to have all the accoutrements. Like you shouldn't have the Barbie dream car or the Barbie house. Those you had to make yourself. So I had the Barbies and I had the outfits and I had the underwear, but then they all lived in shoe boxes and they drove like Coke cans. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. I think on that note, <laughs> I think that's a good place to end this Q&A unless you would like to. Uh, all right. Do we, I can open it up to um, everyone else or if you'd like to read yeah. If anybody has a question, you are welcome to ask it. I realize this book has only been out a matter of a few days, so it is unlikely that you have questions about it yet, but I'm happy to answer them if you do. And if not, I'm going to ask her questions, because I have the working mic. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, I think they want you to, because we're recording, they want you to say it into that mic. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I'm really curious. I love reading anthologies, and I wonder, as someone who runs a bookstore, how did this inform your writing? Were there certain books that you were certain you didn't want to be like? That's a great question. Um, to be clear, I should say I do not run that bookstore. I have like a tiny, tiny role in it, and if they ever watch this, they would be like, did you let them believe you ran that store? <laughs> I don't. I'm so unimportant in the bookstore. Um, Yes. Working in a bookstore is a fantastic day job to have when you are a writer because you see people coming in and out all the time who do this thing that you want to do. And you know how you tell like little girls, if you can see it, you can be it. That works for adults, too. So being at a a bookstore that is um, we're owned by the novelist Ann Patchett and her business partner, Karen Hayes, and we're in like the it city of Nashville. So everyone wants to come there on book tour, which means every night there is some wonderful genius person who has written a great book that you can just meet. And they're just regular people, which is wonderful and and makes it seem very doable it is also very daunting so there's kind of a flip side the good part is you see people writing books all the time and it seems really doable and the other side is oh my god everyone is so much smarter than me and their books are so great and how am I ever going to finish one there's like five new ones every five minutes in here and I can't finish this one essay in terms of books that I did or didn't want to be like it wasn't so much that I would go that book is bad and I don't want to do that and this book is good and I do want to do that but I could see um, I could see what people were drawn to and what people were missing and that conversation I mentioned earlier where that I saw repeatedly where people would pull books down and then put books back made me think there's something people are looking for that they're not finding Mm -hmm. and maybe that's what this book could be but there were also moments where I would read an essay collection and it was so good that it would kind of like stop me in my tracks. I Am, I Am, I Am by Maggie O'Farrell that came out last year, about this time last year. It's just out in paperback. was so good, and I made the mistake of reading it. There it is. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you, spokesmodel. Um, It was so good, and I made the mistake of reading it while I was in the revision process. Like, I had sold the book, but I had six months to get it back to my editor with all her changes made, and Mm -hmm. that is a really hard time because you've kind of wrung out everything you can do for the book and then they want you to do more and I read that book and it is so good I had to like not look at my computer for a week because I thought well I'm never going to be able to write that I can't do it but then it was fine thank you yeah anybody else Yes. Hello. Hi. I have the dubious fortune of being a social media copywriter right now, and your presence on Twitter breathes life into my days. And I wondered if you had any fun stories to share of maybe some of the good things the internet and social media in particular has done for us. That's a good question. Um, I have such mixed feelings about social media. We were talking about this a little bit at supper before we came over. 
I love the conversational aspects of it. I love how it helps me stay in touch with my friends who live far away and I can see, oh, my friend is doing stand-up comedy now. Look, there, I can watch a little piece of her set and that's wonderful and fun. And I think on a corporate level, it enables companies and businesses to do that too and it humanizes entities that didn't used to seem human and now you can have a conversation with Wendy's and that's hysterical. Um, but it is manipulative. And we both have children who are getting older and getting to the ages where they are starting to have exposure to social media. And everything about social media is designed to manipulate you in some way, either emotionally to get a reaction so that you're like, yeah, slap a heart on that thing or to make you want to buy something or whatever. So I know it has that manipulative aspect that's not great. I know it can make people feel bad in a comparing your highlight reel to my real life kind of way. But I do love the conversational part. I love that if you're in a, in a creative industry or any industry, I guess, you can talk to other people who do what you do. If you live in South Dakota and your nearest neighbor is a horse, you can still get on Twitter and tweet with Roxanne Gay. Like, that's amazing that that's a thing you can do. I hope that answers that question. Thank you. Yeah. I haven't read the book yet, but I did read the excerpt, the essay that was published online oh. about like different ways to look at how your mom oh, yes. raised you. Yeah. And when you talked about Ashley Ford's tweet about not people's choices aren't a judgment on your choices, the first thing I think of as the mother of a 15 month old is the mommy wars. So I'm just wondering, I will read the book regardless, but um, <laughs> if you talk about it or if you have any advice on non-reactionary parenting because so much of the choices we make are rebelling against how we were parented right or how other people see our parenting or trying yeah. to be that perfectionist yeah. while knowing that we're going to fail horribly yeah help it's <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if i can help um I'm thinking through the book. So there is some parenting in the book. Parenting in the book. There's not a lot. It's not like a book all about motherhood. And you're, if you said 15 months old is your baby's age. I mean, you are right. You are right in the thick of that transition from I was a person and now I am a person with a child. And for in the middle, you were a person with a baby, which is kind of like a person with a puppy or a doll. But now your baby is turning into a person, and it is. I remember that time very vividly. And in addition to reacting to the way. I was raised, I remember being very aware of how everyone else did everything too. Like, what kind of baby food did you buy? And well, why do you have that stroller? And I have this stroller and wondering how much of it mattered. Like, does it matter which kind of socks you get your baby? Uh, you know, and you don't know early on what matters and what doesn't. It's only in retrospect that you can go, none of that shit mattered. Um, so I don't know that I have advice other than that, like, if you can, and this isn't really in the book. I'm not a good advice giver. Your but, book, just you know, on Amazon is in like midlife management. It is? Oh. I hate Amazon. We just looked it up. <laughs> midlife management? Sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Gross. We're in an independent bookstore. We're not going to say the A word again. Sorry. But thank you. Um, that's hilarious. Half this book takes place in my 20s. God, Amazon. Anyway. It's all relative. <laughs> if I were to give you any advice at all. And it, like, really, I'm thinking of what advice I would give myself when I had a 15 month old. It would be if you can like mentally lift yourself up like you're in a time machine and move to some different parts of your life, either parts you have already lived or like sort of hypothetically take yourself into the future and give yourself a little time and perspective on the moment that you're in. Um, I understand myself so much better as a young mother now than I did then when I thought every single thing mattered so, so much. Most of it doesn't matter that much. And very little of it matters a lot, if that helps. I mean, keep, you know, keep them alive. Yeah, I, and I try. <laughs> you have to feed your baby and all that stuff. But a lot of the little stuff that seems like it matters that people fight about and like judge each other about, it's not worth judging about. Um, I know the book's only been out a week, a little yeah. bit more than a week. And besides Amazon being in the, you, uh, sorry, I didn't even say that word. Besides the fact that we just learned, what's been the most surprising since you, since the book's re been released? Like the surprising things that have happened? Yeah. What's most surprising to you since the book's been released? Um, I, I was surprised at how, I did not expect people to tell me so many of their own personal stories. I didn't think that was going to happen. I've gotten a lot of emails and letters 
and um, like people in the signing line going, I really love this essay. And, and almost as if to prove to me how much they loved it, they then tell me their very personal story, which is, I'm not saying don't do that. That's totally fine. Um, I just didn't expect it. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I'm sort of carrying around a lot of stories I did not know I would be receiving in this process. Mm -hmm. And it is absolutely an honor to receive those stories, but it is, it's just not something I expected. Mm -hmm. It's cool. It's neat, but it's sort of strange. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. I have a question. What, um, not necessarily what are you reading right now, because I know that for your job, you have to read specific things. What's a book or two from the past year that you've super loved since we're in a bookstore and there are holidays coming up where you will have to give gifts and there might be books you want to purchase. What's, what would you recommend if someone was like, what should I buy in here? You mean besides your book? Besides I miss you when I blink. Yeah. <laughs> well, that Maggie, that's not a new book, but, um, the Maggie O'Farrell book, I would, <laughs> why are you putting me on the spot? Um, yeah, well, really one of my favorite books has yet to come out, so I don't really want to say, right? Oh. Um, but, um, hmm. as I said, I spend most of my time reading children's books, um, and um, <laughs> I really like Jason Reynolds and Catherine Applegate. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, well, um, <laughs> yes, we were talking about this at dinner. Um, and what? And what about you? I could do this all day. I'm a bookseller. Okay, books I love: um, the I Am, I Am, I Am by Maggie Farrell. If you want to do like more of the memoir and essays, thank you. Um, if you want to do more memoir and essays, if you're like, well, I'm just gonna. Go through this genre. That's a great one. Alexander Chi, um, How to Write an Autobiographical Novel, which is not actually a how-to book. It is a memoir in essays, is just about perfect. Those are two that are both out in paper book ne paperback now that I love. <laughs> I know. Um, what else is good? We can talk after. Ask me in the signing line. Should we do the signing line now? Is it time for that? I feel like maybe it is. No one is going to tell us what to do. It's time for the signing line. <laughs> we can? Let's do it. Thank you for having me at Politics and Prose. I love this place. And thank you. That was fun.